Hello and welcome to the People, Place and Nature podcast. One of the major projects that's always stuck with me and was really important for me as a child was the Eden Project. Such an incredible piece of engineering and a melting pot of ideas. Its ethos has always been an inspiration to me and so many others that I've met as well. Being able to go back and film this episode there and being able to stay and see it after dark was really just an amazing experience. So we're going to today be discussing with the CEO of Eden International, David, about the ethos of Eden and a bit about how the project came to be and how it's evolved. So I really hope you enjoy this episode. Thank you so much for giving us some of your time this evening. I'm really excited to talk to you about the history of the Eden project, um, what Eden's been up to lately, and also you know, what the plans are for the future. So maybe you could start by telling us a bit about the, the history of the Eden project? Well, I certainly can. I mean, we're sitting here on a you know, lovely evening in the, mm -hmm. in the Mediterranean um, biome. It's all rather twinkly, isn't it? And, it is. It's amazing. Um, it's like the stars are above us as well, it, which is quite incredible. It is. You get kind of three layers, actually, because mm -hmm. of, the, of the ETFE that's in there, so which is rather, rather lovely. But look, we're sitting in a former China clay pit. Um, and when I was growing up down here, um, there were plenty of these pits around. Uh, and the thing about, about it at that time in the, in the 80s and 90s was that there was the mining company was starting to retrench. So mm. Cornwall had a rich history of mining, actually lead, copper, tin, and then China clay. Um, and mining companies do this. You get the boom and the bust. So if you go off into, into St. Austell here, lovely houses um, from a certain period, and, and um, there was a lot of wealth. Mm. Then as I, as I was growing in the 80s, they went from about 20,000 jobs to 1,500. But the problem are. with mining, mm -hmm. which, by the way, we need you know, for, for our lives, by the way, we're not anti-mining anyway, but uh, the problem with mining is it leaves scars on the landscape as well mm -hmm. as scars on the, on the communities. Yeah. Um, and so as, as I grew up here, this was a place you were going to leave if you were going to do something with your mm -hmm. life. You know, it was a place where, if you like, hope was evaporating. Mm -hmm. And what Eden was, was a, was a response to that um, and also to the environmental debate of the, of the late 90s. So, and the, the thinking is, if you can take a place that's apparently hopeless, that's derelict, that's mm -hmm. sterile, that's been used up by humans, and you can breathe new life into it, and you can create the largest rainforest in captivity, you know, these plant conservatories, yeah. then you can get into a dialogue about the natural world and our dependence upon it. Mm -hmm. um, and that was, that was the original idea. Happily for, for us and, <laughs> and for this area, it's been a you know, great success. Um, you know, we've had 22 million visitors or so now come through the doors. Wow. Um, and I think what, what's changed is if it, it's really, We've been reflecting on this a lot lately because we're, we're filming this as COP26 actually is, is, is on and, and we've been up there. But I think our journey over the last 20 years has changed. Mm -hmm. If you remember the late 90s, people were denying that there was an environmental issue. They yeah. were denying that climate change was a thing, let alone discuss whether or not it was man-made. And so the Eden way has always been to, to take people on a, on a bit of a journey, mm -hmm. to not tell them what to think, yeah. Um, but to inspire them, to educate them, to engage them within the issues so that when they leave after four or five hours, they might actually, you know, change the way that they, that they think about the world. Where we are today is, I think, if I was being positive, I'd say in the last five years it's been accepted. Let, let's agree the last two or three for, for certain yeah. is that everybody accepts that we've got an issue. Um, and now we've got to sort it out. So our, our method of communication is also changing as well to become um, much more definite on certain, certain issues. And, and that's a change. And we're trying to work out how to, if you like, arm everyone with the tools that they need to take agency in their own lives for their own businesses, you know, actually you know, at a governmental level as well. Well, it's such an important message. I mean, I came here as a, um, as a kid, I think I was eight when the Eden Project first opened. And I think I came here with school maybe that year. So I remember it and it's quite, I've been here a couple of times since, but the amount, you know, how much everything has grown and how it's changed and adapted since I've been, it's, it's always incredibly interesting to come and see the, see the change. But I remember even back then, you know, how, much it, how inspiring it was. And, you know, I think it's definitely coming to places like this that led me to going into the environmental world. Um, and a lot of people I know, you know, I've been inspired by similar things. And the more you're, you can see it, the more you can interact with it, the more you value it, and the more you understand it, which is all, you know, is vital. And as you say, at the moment, we're going through such an important time. And Attenborough describes it as a hinge moment where it could go either way. Yep. Um, and hopefully things are moving in the right direction. But actually, again, as you've said, it's all about empowering people and letting them know that actually it's not all doom and gloom. There is this huge opportunity to reevaluate where we are, 
redesign where we are and reassess our systems to make them more sustainable, make them better for people um, and nature. I, I, I couldn't have said it much better, to be honest. And I think that's what this place is, is that the solutions that we're now looking for are not simple. You mm. know, it, it, of course it's good for all of us to, I don't know, recycle, we should yeah. probably eat less meat, uh, we should, you know, be looking at green travel and all, all mm -hmm. of those, those good things. But what, what's required is holistic system change and, yeah. and, and system thinking around that. And I think what us humans, okay, we're, we're, we're a storytelling ape, mm -hmm. ultimately, um, and we've passed down um, through, you know, our, our legends and so on through stories. And I think the same applies today is that there is there's something about being presented with a vision of hope that you that you know that that story of transformation is immensely powerful and i think the world needs examples and it needs exemplars mm -hmm. um we had a we, i mean we had this um, guy come over from america um, mm -hmm. he's called david millarch he's uh, part of the archangel uh, tree archive um and he's a former hell's angel you know um uh, you know it, it, and all of the things that go with mm -hmm. with that but he had decided that he wanted to dedicate his life to trees. So what he yeah. does is he clones redwoods and sequoias. Oh, right. So we came, he came over some, we, we've climbed some in the sequoias. Mm. They're amazing, they live for 4,000 plus uh, years. Um, but you get a group of school children together and you say, where are you gonna plant a tree mm -hmm. that lives for 4,000 years? Oh, and by the way, it's gonna be 103 feet, or at least its mother was, mm -hmm. it's gonna be 103 feet across. <laughs> And then they start saying, well, you can't park it near the road. Well, is the road going to be here? Yeah. You know, what's actually going to be happening? And I think it's by those times, and it's just a small example. It was, we were just blown away seeing David with these school children, mm -hmm. you know, kind of really seeing the impact that that had on them. Um, and, and so I think we need those sort of things in our lives. Yes, we need the, the hard science as well. But one of the problems is that the, the language of the environment is so difficult, actually, yeah. when, when you step back from it. Um, it can be quite hostile. Yeah, in a way. It, mm. it, it can, and it, 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 it can. I mean, we can't even agree, can we, at the moment, whether whether carbon negative or carbon positive is the good one. If, if, if you see mm. what I mean, I, um, we tend to we've tended to try to talk here about climate positive because we think that at least allows people to to make the connection. Um, but even that's a compromise. And mm. um, we have an ambassador, Bill McDonough, who who um, you know, great American architect, and he. He looked us all in the eye one day and he said, um, if, you, if you talked about your relationship as being sustainable, it doesn't sound very good, does it? And yet that's the language that we yeah. use. And I, I, so, you know, I, I, that, that's very much stuck with me. So, uh, but, and we need, to, we need to take those things and we need to, we need to change that, uh, that narrative as well. Oh, absolutely. I mean, that's partly why we decided to set this podcast series up is because there are these incredible stories and it's come up a few times today, actually, while we've been talking and walking around with, with people here, that actually most people that have ended up in positions now, you know, quite senior in the environmental world, actually never started there. Mm -hmm. They had very different backgrounds, very different beginnings, yeah. but they've kind of found a way that worked for them and they've managed to make more change than they thought they ever could. So, for example, we had Dusty Gedge on and he started as a circus performer. He now is, um, you know, the president of the European Federation for Green Moves and yeah. is behind a huge range of Green Move projects all over Europe. You know, it's having a huge impact. Um, but people, people often assume that the only way to get involved in things is by, you know, this um, deep education or, or um, you know, history of involvement mm -hmm. or whatever else. But actually, because there's so much that needs to be done, there's so much opportunity for people to get involved. And there's such a range of things happening that's really inspiring and and varied and there's this you know range of things to do that you might often you know not associate together people are yeah. working together that you otherwise would never have thought yeah. would have done well and that's what's going to get us out of us is, is people working together people being interested in subject matters i mean and tim our founder talks about, about this was that his view that was that if he was interested in this mm -hmm. then there surely must be you know he said if i'm not a complete you know, nutcase. There must be the load of other people that are interested in this as well. And you know, happily, he was he was right. I think um, I think we're all a bit like this. That that none of us have ever done anything because we were told to do it, or at least yeah. not willingly, have we? So definitely. Um, and I, you know, I, I know many people in the environment movement who have who actually I know some who started you know from the age of you know fourteen, sixteen. They that's what they were going to do. But you're right. There's many others who who've come along. I mean, we. 
we joke slightly uh, here that um, you know those in the oil and gas industry, you know, they need a bit of redemption. So they're the perfect <laughs> people because they, they're like ex-smokers, aren't they? Yeah, so, yeah, <laughs> so no, absolutely. Then, so, yeah. Um, but I, I think it it, it requires um, it requires a transdisciplinary approach. Actually, that's what absolutely, you know, and, yeah. and that's what what you have around you. I mean, just just behind us here, we've got arts and sculpture and we, mm. yes we've got the plants and it's a canvas on which you you kind of tell those those stories and there's some really serious messages that that happen and um you know we've we've just announced this uh wonderful piece of work by daisy ginsburg called pollinator pathway mm. uh, um which is actually you'd love it as a landscape mm -hmm. architect yeah, actually maybe maybe it just gets rid of landscape architects and so maybe you hate <laughs> it but no but what she's what she's done is that she's She's an artist. She's drawn the the plants that that then you can take any size of plot, um, and it will create. Um, depending on the parameters that you put in, do you want to have more pollinators? Do you want mm. to have more colour at certain times of the year? And it will then create in front of you how you can do your own five meter square or fifty meter square or whatever it is that you have, but specifically about pollinators. Mm -hmm. So that if you want more bees or you want you know more moths or whatever, that that it comes in, and and it's those sorts of things the first one i've seen where it's it, it's it i mean i think it's probably the first carbon neutral artwork you know in, in that <laughs> way of course it's got servers to power it, power it but we but we've made sure that they, those are um dealt with with the with the outputs that are coming out of it and it's those sort of that that sort of blend that's suddenly so interesting because you, you it, the, there's lots of people trying lots of different things but actually when somebody from the public sees that they go oh yeah i can i can do that yeah i can exactly. tie that in and now i can i know and that's how i know i can go and buy that plant on those plants, and so I can do that. And I think it—that's it, 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 a rather neat little example um, of, well, of a bit of holism. I think it's a, a brilliant example because, you know, what, what are we trying to do at the end of the day, as you know, as landscape designers? Um, you know, we're trying to make places for people a lot of the time, and we obviously want those places to be um, usable for people, where they feel comfortable, where they feel safe. But obviously, we want them to have as much benefit for um, the ecosystem mm. as, as possible. So, if you're able to take away some of that legwork. You know, it means we've got more time to do what? Well, we can spend more time focusing on people, yep. which is becoming even more important as time goes on. You know, look at um, sort of the care crisis we have at yep. the moment, uh, the mental health issues people have yep. got. Um, it's all about getting people involved and engaged. And if people have an opportunity to kind of design their own plot or get more involved with the design of a piece of a city or whatever it may be, that's, as we said before, that's how they foster ownership and that's how they It, it, it they get definitely involved. is. And they will feel better. Mm. As well, I mean, there's a, there's an uh, amazing research now that that shows that in the recovery from, I mean, the research has been done on people mm. recovering from from operations, that if they have a plant in their room, they recover quicker, mm -hmm. you know, than someone who doesn't. If they can see a plant through the window, they will. Even if I think the research says, even if you can see a picture of a plant, <laughs> then you'll recover better. And and we know, you know, I mean, we're sitting here with a fantastic palm, aren't we, right now? Yeah, beautiful. And, and yeah. trees are just. Fantastic. I don't know anyone who doesn't like trees, mm -hmm. you know, and, and, and can't stand in front of a, you know, a large oak or a redwood, as we were talking about, and just feel, on the one hand, quite small, but also that, that these are beautiful things, aren't mm -hmm. they, that, 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 that live for a long time. Um, and they make you feel better by being out in the, in the natural world. And I think that's what, you know, landscape architecture is, is, is oft underrated. And, and mm -hmm. we're sitting here in a beautifully engineered... Um, very well designed biome. I mean, they're immensely efficient given how, you know, mm -hmm. they're 20 years old and, um, you know, Grimshaw are great mates of ours who did mm -hmm. the, the, did the um, architecting. What makes this place so special is actually the landscape. So, mm -hmm. and, and the guy behind it was, was, uh, was Dominic Cole. And you don't see a straight line in the whole place. If you see even from the air, because nature doesn't have straight lines and mm -hmm. it all just finishes. And it does give you that sense of, there's, there's something about walking through here early morning or late at night where it just feels like these biomes should all have been there, always been there. Yeah. They, they, I sound like a hippie if I, stick, <laughs> if I keep going here, but they almost have this sort of sense that they're, that they're, they're breathing, if you like, mm. in, in some way. Um, and, I, I, and that's about the landscape and the, and the buildings really working together and just making you feel that, that you are... You know they are of that that's place. it. Well, it was that's exactly it's that sense of place, isn't it? It's so important. It's how do you integrate something into a place where it feels like it should belong, and it's all about looking at 
the landscape of what was there, yeah. um, you know, and thinking, okay, well, what materials would be used here? What stone is there? What plants are here? And all of a sudden you create that story. And in the UK where it's incredibly degraded, you have the opportunity to recreate and regenerate those yeah. areas and, and bring all of these things back, which is, which is incredibly exciting. It, it is, and, and I think that's what, what we've seen. Our, our, you know, we've been lucky enough to work on some projects all, all over the, the world. And, uh, God, if you if you kind of type in what do I do with an old mine, you know, into Google, <laughs> then we come up quite high. So we get a lot of requests, mm. um, most of which we 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 turn down. Um, but it's the ones that we're interested in is where you can have real impact mm. with people and place, and obviously tell our story, our, our kind of um, the, you know drive our mission forward, yeah. if you will. Um, and they tend. What we find with our our team is that. <laughs> It's quite funny. They 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 go they go and research an area. It always sounds so dull when you say research, but what they're doing is they're unearthing un, unearthing unearthing the stories, um, and uh, of those places. And we then play them back to the people of those mm-hmm. of those places, and they were sort of hiding in plain sight, if, yeah. if, if you like. And then they make it feel like you're not the cuckoo in the nest, if you like, coming in that you're actually part of, of, of that community and then you can grow it together. And it's incredibly exciting. We're doing it in Dundee at the moment with, mm-hmm. the, with the Dundonians. And it's, it's just so much fun when you, when you see their faces actually looking back and hear their stories and then, and then see it all being played in, in both directions and that you can really see that that can make a tangible difference. Yeah, definitely. No, it's, it's so important. And those people, as we said already, they, you know, they protect that place and they're willing to sort of stand up for it and improve it and all of this type of thing too. So it's all about getting people, it's taking people with you, isn't it? It's taking people with you on the journey, not just coming in and imposing something, which is really important. Oh, 100% that's true, which is not to say that we don't need the activists as well, you know, oh, along indeed, the yeah. way, so that, that are, you know, up there in, in Glasgow um, at the moment, you know, holding up the mirror, you know, to some of the activities that we've got. I think, and, I think you're absolutely right. And there's, there's definitely two sides to it because quite often you see the profession, in my opinion anyway, you see the professional side um, on one side and the activist side on the other. And quite often there's a lot of animosity of the activists going, well, why aren't you doing more? And the professionals are going, well, we are doing more, but you're painting us in a bad light or whatever. And you get this very difficult situation, but actually without the other, very little would happen because you won't be able to deliver what you need to do in the way that it needs yeah. to necessarily be done in a sensitive manner. But also you need to raise those issues with government or whoever it may be and actually say, look, there's a serious problem here. And it's all about going in together, isn't it? Raise the problem, bring in the solution. And that's what we need to try and do. And I think that's what's becoming more apparent now is actually, yeah. and again, partly why we decided to set the podcast up, you know, it's People, Place and Nature podcast. It's all about this kind of ethos is that actually there are these solutions. There are so many solutions to all of these problems. It's just a lot of people aren't aware of them mm-hmm. or how they might work or what opportunities there yep. actually are. So how do we encourage people to get involved? How do we start to tackle them? How do we bring, take people together and forward together? Well, look, I mean, in the end, we've got some choices to mm-hmm. take, haven't we? we, we the, the, you know, change is difficult, there's, there's, there's no doubt. And I think there's, there's going to be a, a moment where uh, sorry, I mean, not just a moment. I think there's going to be many moments where, where companies and governments have got to take decisions. And I don't like saying this, but I, I think in the end, there comes a point where I suspect governments are going to have to tax or, incent, you know, or incentivize one way or the other. They're, they're the same thing to get certain behaviors to happen because they're Indeed. just not happening quickly enough. Exactly. And, yeah. And, and I think most people would be supportive of that. Mm-hmm. I think the, the, the pandemic has been interesting, hasn't it? That um, what, what's the, um, <laughs> don't stop the take there. Oh, the pandemic's <laughs> interesting. But, <laughs> so, but what, what has it told us? It's actually told us that our local areas are really important to us mm-hmm. and that local, um, local had come to somehow mean parochial in some ways. So, if, you know, it was sort of negatively viewed. Whereas actually a muscular localism that comes out of this because, you know, because what, what, what's, what's a global solution? Well, it's a series of locals added together, isn't it? Yeah. In the end. Um, and, and I think this, this idea that you, you have to, you know, um, that, that each, each place can't um, benefit from its surroundings and that you can't have a style of living in, in the regions as you can in the cities and so on, is it, just going to change because we're going to see technology allowing us to, to take some of those decisions. We were, um, we were up in, actually it was in Dundee again, and, and looking at a vertical growing mm-hmm. um, farm. Um, which was just basically in three containers, 
that that could grow enough food for three or four hundred people yeah. for their five a day, you know, in this one unit. Oh, and by the way, it manages power off the grid. Mm -hmm. um, it's it's got more efficiency in terms of the way that it grows. They have less deaths within the within the plants and and so on. You realise that there's things out there that if people were aware of, they would they would very quickly get behind it. And that's the sort of thing that we're going to be showing here. So uh, to really bring to oh, life. Oh, fascinating! People. Yeah, I'm really interested in that. I mean, I've been looking quite a lot into hydroponics and aquaponics and yeah. vermiponics, which we found out the other day, which is at the actual best closed loop solution. We had a wormologist on, Anna Della Vega, and she's been working on a project um, using worms to break down food waste. But worms produce all of the nutrients that are required Amazing. for hydroponics. So, and they can basically make a tea bag from the worm castings, incorporate that into the hydroponic system, and then you don't need the artificial. For, um, uh, nutrient solutions to go into it. Wow. So actually, it's one of the best ways to make it properly closed loop. I better listen to the podcast. That sounds, <laughs> it sounds brilliant. That's it. So, that, you know, but again, it's a solution that a lot of people probably wouldn't have been aware yeah. of. Um, and we, I wasn't aware of until we did, did the podcast, despite having read quite a lot into the subject area. Um, and it's fascinating when you find out things like supermarket, for example. If you take the footprint of a large supermarket, it can potentially um, replace 700 acres of farmland, yeah. which is pretty amazing. The big challenge, however, is when it comes to, um, um, what's the word? I can't remember the word. Um, sort of base foods like mm. oats, yep. potatoes, that yep. type of things. Staples, that's the yep. word. Staples. Um, staples is the big problem. But I mean, things like genetic engineering and things like that, um, or genetic modification, um, either way, it doesn't sound that great, does it? But no. um, you know, some of the solutions there, making crops shorter and things like that, means they can actually start to fit into some of these systems too. Yep. But then the opportunity to produce that aspect of our food, the more root vegetable style um, or staple, there's a huge oppo opportunity for sort of community there. there you know, there's no reason why we can't look at producing those foods more in community systems and getting people engaged. Because that's one of the big worries for me with a lot of this more automated food production is, yes, it's great, you can have it more locally, that's potentially one option, but the other option is it goes much more commercial mm -hmm. and you end up in a situation where people are even further disconnected from food, yep. where you're at a point where you no longer see it in the fields. Yep. Um, so how do, you, you know, how do you tie those two together? Because the community side will never feed everyone. We need the, um, this hydroponic system to free up land to regenerate, yep. um, but also we need that sort of, those sort of staples being delivered too. So there's gonna be a really interesting debate about how that will all come to work. And it's going to, you know, hopefully lead to a lot of innovation and a change in the ways people engage with, with the natural world. I, I, I think it will. And, and you know, we're, we're talking about farming there. I think the same is going to be true of, of rivers, you mm -hmm. know, and, and probably of, of air as well. Yeah. And, um, you know, we, we very much have the sense that, you know, those that are if you like, those, those that are poisoning our air, poisoning mm -hmm. our soils and, and um, you know, poisoning our rivers are, I guess, treasonous to the future, aren't they? Mm -hmm. and, 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 and those that aren't are, you know, our friends, <laughs> you know, and, and I think that's how society is going to move because mm -hmm. it just, it's just, it cannot be right that the majority of the rivers up and down the country can't be, can't be swum in or, you know, yeah. got, got, you know, nitrate runoff and, 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 and sewage and so on going on. And mm. when you look at the, the, the stats, they're pretty shocking. They are, yeah. Um, and yet we've created this mm -hmm. and it, 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 it is this balance thing that you would, you would, we were just talking about. And um, the, thing, the thing that's clear is that there's enough of us starting to move into this to make the changes. And you now see you know, big oil and gas companies also sort of moving the, the, the way that they're thinking. And, you know, geothermal up on our, mm. on our perimeter. There, if you wanted an example right now of economic transition, there you've got it. You know, that's an oil rig basically sitting on the, on the top um, of our site. Mm. Um, and, you know, now down at whatever, 5.4 um, kilometres, uh, and will produce baseload here, for us, I mean, it's the most exciting thing that we've worked on for, for 10 years, and yet yeah. it's a technology that hasn't been backed by the UK government that we as a, as a private organisation have had to, you know, to, to sort of keep forcing through over the last 10 years and could deal with 20% of the UK's power needs. You know, not that one hole, by the way, but the, <laughs> with the, with the technology, that would be pretty cool, wouldn't yeah. it? And, and it makes you wonder, and it's relatively, relatively inexpensive in terms of, you know, as compared with, with yeah, nuclear over time, and so on yeah. and, and over time. And um, again, another great example, but it makes you wonder why that hasn't been um, something that we've followed up because it exists in a number of different locations a, a, across the mm -hmm. UK. Um, and if you're an oil rig owner, um, 
you know, the thought was that you couldn't drill to five, six, seven, eight, nine kilometers of the geothermal. But actually, if you've got the technology sitting there and it's not drilling for oil and gas, you're going to drill as deep as anyone will, you know, yeah. will, will get the heat. So suddenly Absolutely. having these things around, and it's a really small footprint mm -hmm. as well in terms of the, of, of the building. So, um, so it's, it, it's, you know, there's, there's many rays of optimism Mm -hmm. But we cannot take. Oh God, that's a mixed metaphor. I was going to say we can't take, <laughs> take my foot off the gas. Um, but, <laughs> so, but we've really got to keep taking action. I think you know is the point. Absolutely. But again, it's about how people get involved as well. And you see other technologies like solar, for example, where more and more people I know that you know had no real. In, I don't say they had no real interest, but they weren't as you know animated about the environment as perhaps I am. Um, you know, they're just looking at it from an economic basis. They're looking at their bills going. God, the energy price is going up. Well, you know, 3.5% interest at the moment, probably going to get worse. Yeah. And, um, you know, rising energy costs. Well, actually, it suddenly becomes very economic to invest in solar. If you've got money in the bank, you know, there's no interest in the bank, you may as well invest it in something well, like that. It, it, I mean, the electric cars is, is exactly the same thing. Yeah. I mean, now, happily, what, one in 10, you know, of, of cars registered this year are, are, um, are, are electric. And you suddenly see range anxiety is disappearing mm -hmm. because you've got, you know, the, the network and so on. But it requires those, it requires, you know, I was reading recently Ecotricity, who were, you know, they put in yeah. the original electric um, uh, highway and they were making the point that they were installing 350 kilowatt chargers only 10 years after they installed their first charger, which was three kilowatts. <laughs> um, and, you know, the, the difference being about 41 hours <laughs> between charging a, you know, a fairly standard um, electric car. Um, that, that's actually really quite quick, but mm -hmm. it's taken your Teslas and these exactly, guys yeah. to actually to, to come well, in and, you, and break You need those innovators, don't you, to come in and sort of push things forward and get things moving. You do, and I, and I think it's our role as well to, to really um, to help those innovators to get their message out there so that they become mainstream as quickly as is humanly possible. Exactly. Um, and, you know, that's, that's very much what we, we're, you know, I think moving to here is, is, you know, the idea of a living laboratory, if you like, mm -hmm. is, is can we get people to come in and, and showcase stuff because it's interesting to, to the public and, and people are interested, um, and at the same time accelerate some of the, the, the development that people are having mm -hmm. as well so that, that there's somewhere to see this stuff because a lot of it's buried in, you bureaucracy know, out of sight. In, and things, and in yeah. bureaucracy, yeah, yeah. Yeah, well, we had a really interesting episode. Um, I'm not here plug, plug, probably plugging our episodes, but they're quite topical because we had one on, on wood, for example, where we were talking about how wood is actually used in so many ways that people don't realise. So, for example, bits of solar panels can be made from timber now. Um, LCD screens can be made of wood. Satellites, bodywork wow. for cars. My ring is wood, you know. And it's just looking at things that we would traditionally have and think, actually, you know, there's a better way to produce these things yep. a more environmentally friendly way and how does that tie into this system that we want to create you know we've talk, already talked about food production and we know the common agricultural policy is gone what's that going to be replaced with well actually it's going to be more diverse more of a mosaic yep. of farmland we'll see hopefully um, which will need more trees how do we use those trees do we want forests like we used to have them which are monocultures all yep. very straight actually can we make use of these lower quality trees if we're breaking them down into a into a product um, because if you think about it, you know, oil and wood are more or less the same mm. thing, essentially. Yep. Um, how do you get wood currently to that sort of composition where we can make use of it? Um, so we've got a sustainable product that's biodegradable at the end um, and, and more usable. So, you know, it's, it's just thinking about how we, we do these things. But again, there's no investment in that in this country. The only plants that are capable of doing that are in Europe and there's 10 in Europe and none in the UK. Yeah. So we've got to start investing in that technology because we know it's the technology of the future or it's, and someone needs to sort of well, take that leap and put it, push it forward. That, it's exactly, I mean, you just described a perfect kind of circular holistic system, you know, mm. in, 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 in that way. And I think it, we've just got to get it, all of our systems to, to, to think like that. And we've then got to, we've got to shift. I mean, I, I, look, we spend quite a lot of time with, with, with government and, and mm -hmm. with big business as well. And, it's not that the people who are working within those places are getting up each morning and kind of shaving down their horns. <laughs> it is that they're, they're, they're trying to shift as well. Yeah. And, I, you know, I don't know if you saw, um, I mean, there's a degree of frustration about, about COP at the moment, mm -hmm. and, and probably rightly so. There's been yeah. some good announcements. Um, but actually what I, I was reading that Mark Carney was trying to do was, was to assemble, actually, I think it was 450 businesses together who, between them, control... 
something like um, 20 or, four, if I forget the exact number, but 20 or 40% of the world's wealth, <laughs> to say, well, if you can get those guys, uh, you know, it doesn't matter about government to, mm -hmm. to a point, but if you can get those guys actually to say, we're committed to, to this route, that can have a real impact as well. And it struck me as a, as a, as a really interesting um, way, way to go. And mm -hmm. um, I don't think it needs to be a, a choice. I mean, we, mm -hmm. you know, we, we stand here on our own two feet. We had, um, we had capital monies, you know, it's mm -hmm. a public-private partnership to set this up. Um, but we get no government funding or, or anything um, now. So we have to be, if you like, capitalist in, mm -hmm. in, the, in our approach. Um, but it's about capitalism with a with a moral compass, proving yeah. that the system was actually yeah. the system that it that it was meant to be, um, and I think we're we've we've allowed ourselves as humans to think that, um, or certain bits of our society have, but that that this five year double your money kind of return is the returns that 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 um, and you know if you like sod the environment yeah you know, exactly. it doesn't, to, it's, it's to a short-term goal it's we a short-term short goal away from yeah and actually if we can get away from endless consumerism and we can start to to actually think about um how things are produced and and um n not that we have to to buy all this this stuff or that we might be responsible by the way for the things that we that we buy in the longer term mm -hmm. you know some of these new technologies where you'll be i i be able to identify who it was that bought this jacket mm -hmm. um and that you're responsible for its for its lifespan if you like um, through through um, through technology is, is is fascinating, and I think our, they, these are all game changers. These mm -hmm. these these things, um, but we we do actually have to take some other other fundam We have to make some fundamental choices uh, uh, along the way, which aren't going to be very comfortable. And um, I, I was saying to you before we started, I, I was lucky enough to hear the Costa Rican president um, give a, a speech at, up in um, at, at COP26. Um, and he was talking about, we're quite lucky in Costa Rica in a way because everyone needs to plant trees. We're lucky we started 50 years ago or 70 yeah. years ago in 1949. Um, but we took choices. We don't have an army, mm -hmm. you know. And he said, you know, wars and terrorism. He said, are we really going to say to our children that um, we, we took that choice to invest in weapons instead of investing in the things that are actually going to get us out of this crisis? Um, and it was a really you know, it's a powerful call to arms. Mm -hmm. He then addressed why it was that Costa Rica was an example in, in, it, in itself. And, and he said, you know, we are, actually it's the same phrase, living, we're a living laboratory. That's what yeah. they signed up to be in Paris. And, um, you know, it, it's admirable. And they, and they have also got this, you know, he said, got to tell you, our electric infrastructure, you know, we're 100% we're renewable, 99.8% renewable, but our electric car re um, infrastructure is terrible, mm. he said. Which is why we've just invested into it because we, we said we, yeah. we realised we've got and it was real honesty, you know, something yeah. that, that you that you see. So um, you might tell I'm a bit of a fan of the of, <laughs> of, of, of the country and and, and we have a oh, wonderful too, exemplar yeah. project there. But mm -hmm. we need more like that. Yeah, we definitely do. And I mean Costa Rica is a fantastic example. I mean I went there on a study tour maybe I don't know, eight years ago or something like that. And um, it was really interesting how they approached some of the challenges they had because they had huge deforestation. But they faced this problem of, do we go in and we plant loads of trees and sod the people? Or do we work with the people to yep. try and create a holistic solution? And initially, I could be wrong here, I don't want to put words in any of the mouths, mm. it, it was a while ago I went there. Um, but essentially what they did was they, they banned deforestation. And then they found that actually people were still carrying on cutting down the trees to grow food and all this type of thing as people need to, to live. Yep. Um, and actually they realized, well, actually this isn't going to work because these, this is all the people have. They, they live off the land yep. here. So they started thinking, okay, well, how do we incentivize people to protect the rainforest? Yep. So what they did is they looked at the services that the rainforest provide and it provided water. So then they looked at water and they said, okay, what can we do with the water? Oh, well, actually we've got huge potential for hydropower. If we want to have the hydropower potential we have, we need the water from the mm -hmm. trees, from the trees transpiring. So they linked all that together and started paying people for the water the forest yeah. produced. And that is basically what common agricultural policy reform should be. Which and that's what it is, looks like it's going to become, which is public money for public good. It's all about um, paying farmers for the, you know, the air quality improvements, the improvement in the soil, um, the water, uh, the flood prevention, the water quality improvements, yep. all of these things, and you know, better recreation for people. And it's that kind of mentality, instead of just giving people money to plant something, instead of giving people money for the land they own, it should be giving them, especially when it's public money, 
absolutely the slogan is right, public money for public good. That's what it, it should absolutely be used for. Well, and it, you know, payment, payment for ecosystem services, wasn't it? Was, yeah. it was, their, was their thing in Costa Rica, which they, they, if you like, invented for the, um, for the world. And um, it, it was, when we didn't really want to do a project in Costa Rica, is, mm-hmm. is the truth. Um, and we, <laughs> we, we got ensnared uh, in, into it because of, by a story, actually, mm-hmm. by someone telling us this story. And... Um, uh, basically, the, the project that we have there is 10,000 acres of, of dry tropical forest, so the, mm. the rarest type and most endangered type of forest, that had been um, put together from 43 kind of low-level dairy farms um, in the late 90s mm. by, by one guy, a Danish entre- entrepreneur called um, Peter Collin. And, and his thing was, I'm going to put the proper fire breaks in, and then I'm going to basically let nature take its course. I'm going to let the birds shit this back to life, basically. <laughs> so, uh, and you know, if you look at it now, it's this. It is a beautiful um, rainforest. It's not technically it's dry tropical forest, yeah. but it looks like a rainforest. Uh, Tim and, and I, our founder and I, were were in Paquera in the town, mm-hmm. and and sadly, Peter died five years ago, mm-hmm. and his sons were fulfilling one of his last wishes, which was to gift the water rights. Um, back to the town from the forest mm-hmm. and the mayor stood up and said uh, there used to be murders and assaults and fights because we were always running out of water um, and now we have water 365 days a year and it's because of because of that forest mm-hmm. he said in this life you don't very often get a second chance mm-hmm. we have been gifted one let's not waste it <laughs> and it was that moment I can I can still sort of feel the shivers on mm-hmm. down my spine it was that moment where we said We've got to do this project, yeah. And the and the project is exactly is is if you like a microcosm of the macrocosm of the, the, that is Costa Rica, which is how do you have healthy people alongside healthy landscapes? Yeah. So what we used to do is put fences around things and say, don't go in there, yeah, you know, leave it alone. Mm-hmm. Um, what what the Costa Ricans have, have realised exactly as you say is we we've, we've really got to just um, we've got to allow people to work with the environment, not mm-hmm. against it. Exactly. And, and I think if we could do that a bit a bit more here as well and. You know, there's there's all sorts of initiatives. You, you'll probably have talked to you know uh, about Half Earth or the 30% by 2030 and all those sort of things, which are you know are kind of um, are an important part of this. But mm-hmm. we've, we've got to just balance. Um, we've got to make sure that 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 isn't people grabbing hold of land yeah. and saying this is this is this is all mine, um, and um, you're not to come in because exactly. that won't work either. Well, exactly, and that's part of how we have to think these whole things through again with the public money for public good it has to be public good it has to be accessible to people and it goes back to what we were talking about initially about you know the the intrinsic value of the natural world to humans it's not just you know the water but obviously that's very important it's how do we live in it how do Mm -hmm. we survive with it how do we integrate with it how do we interact with it how do we use it Um, and we've got to think of all those things too and and as I said take people with us and get them get them actively involved I mean the main thing that actually got me into the environment um, I've talked about this several times on, on the series, but you know, I dropped. I was quite bad in school. I dropped out of college. I didn't know what I wanted to do, and it's only because I got into an environmental sort of program, taking me out, cutting trees down, and building fences, and working with cows, that I started actually going. Well, actually, do you know, what? I really enjoy this. Mm-hmm. Um, I really I want to be outside. I yep. want to be involved in the natural world, and that is what got me back into education and, and sitting here now. And if that hadn't have happened, I would I wouldn't be here. Um, who knows what I'd be doing? Well, yeah. So. And, but again, I, I know a lot of people that have done similar things and it's really turned their lives around. So it's about identifying options like that and integrating with things like education it is, as well. It, it is. And, and funnily enough, we, we, we run um, apprenticeships here and, mm-hmm. and degree programmes in horticultural science and, and actually landscape and design, you'll be pleased to know as well. I'm very pleased, um, yeah. And the reason that that came up was initially was we were really struggling to get horticulturalists. So we thought, mm-hmm. we'll, you know, the kind of line was we grow our own. Yeah. Um, and, uh, but actually what, what we also wanted to do was to change the nature of, of horticultural science, mm-hmm. which, you know, horticulture wasn't, you know, if you, if you were deciding, you know, what, what did you want your offspring to do? It was, if you like, a career for the third thickest son of the third thickest son. It was digging a hole in the, in the rain, if you, mm-hmm. if you like. Um, that's how it, that was how it was viewed. Oh, you want to do accountancy or you want to do legal, you know. You yeah. Don't, yeah. Whereas actually the reality is, and particularly in Britain, is that one of our greatest gifts to the world was the fact that we can actually grow stuff. You know, the, yeah. the, many of the technologies um, came from, from here. And yet we haven't invested in it. Mm-hmm. And so we felt there was a need, and we've now got 180 or so students here studying oh, on fantastic. that. Oh, fantastic. Because actually, if you want to 
you know, if you want to be able to grow stuff, if you want to, you know, be able to look after the environment in the right, right well, you're going to need some people that really understand all of well, those components. That's one of the other really big challenges that a lot of people are not aware of is there's actually a huge shortage of professionals. So Massive. now is the opportunity. Again, it's an opportune time to get involved because there's opportunities now that there's never been yep. in terms of um, availability of jobs, in terms of opportunities for education, um, in terms of opportunities for sort of advancement. You know, I was 20, I think 23, and I ended yeah. up on the World Council for our profession. You know, that's not something that happens very commonly, but those opportunities are happening now, and there's a huge, you know, again, opportunity for people to get involved and, you know, yeah. lead the way. But we need people to sort of realize that these professions, A, exist, um, two, how important they are, and three, where on earth are they gonna, where are they gonna get them? So yeah. what you're doing here is fantastic, and I'm really pleased that there is a landscape course here because it's so vital to so much of what we want to achieve. Well, and, uh, you know, there's, there's plenty of it. There's, you know, ecology. I mean, ecologists are being recruited by the big tech firms because mm. they, they realise that they understand the whole, you know, mm. as it seems to be uh, part of it. So, um, and it, it just, it, it's, when you meet the students as well, and there's a lovely mix of, of the kind of, you know, what we'd all think of as students, the kind of 18 to 22 year old, but a mm. few, you know, people doing, you know, second um, careers as well. It, it, it's actually a rather buoying experience, buoying up sort of experience, mm. because you, you just, um, you realise that these people are committed. This isn't something you undertake lightly, you know, because yeah. you know it's hard hard work for yeah. for, 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 for starters. Is. But they are also driven by a passion for it, which, mm -hmm. you know, look, I, I, I'd like to think I, I sort of had, but I, I studied French and German, so I, I discovered <laughs> this lady a little bit, a little bit like you, so uh, as well, and and. Um, because at that time you were told to do the thing that you were good at. That's exactly. What I was yeah. good at. Yeah. Whereas, you know, if I had my time again, I, I would have loved to have done, you know, uh, something a, a bit more in that that sort of space. Mm -hmm. um, but it, you know, I bet if I read back in my career, you know, you remember those books that we used to have, the career books, mm -hmm. and um, I'm not so sure that it would have featured very highly up on the on the <laughs> uh, you know the list of desirable things to do at that at that stage in the in the 90s. No, that's it. It's it's, it's strange how things come around, isn't it? How people end up like, like they do and where they are. But um, I thought it'd be interesting to talk a bit about some of the other projects that, we're, mm. that are going on here because there's so much going on here at Eden itself with the new geothermal and social prescribing and things yep. are taking place here as well now. Um, do you want to talk a little bit about the social prescribing? Well, so social, social prescribing is, is, is one of those lovely things that we, um, that we sort of fell into, <laughs> if you like. And, mm -hmm. and, it, and it started from a really lovely... Um, sort of basis that we, we've always wanted or we've always liked the idea that this is sort of Cornwall's village hall so mm -hmm. um, actually later this week we're throwing open the doors for the for the sort of annual Christmas fair which is nothing to do with us we just it, it's a, a, a number of charities oh, wow. sort of coming together mm -hmm. um, and in the same way we we um, we've done a bit of work with uh, a COPD group so uh, chronic obstructive pulmonary disorder where they were using the site as part of their treatment mm -hmm. um, and they were getting amazing results actually these are people who've got really uh, real lung difficulties but they mm -hmm. were seeing a you know the social piece of it as well but also the the um, the actual exercising piece and so that's grown now into a sort of wider program which has got those sort of components but it's got a health and well-being component it's got a growing sort of component um, and this stuff that was sort of seen as if you like a bit kind of hippie shit now mm -hmm. is in the mainstream as well um, and you know, is, is being researched here as well to show that it has real, uh, you know, positive outcomes on the people that, that are in it. Oh, and by the way, you know, it costs the NHS less mm. as, uh, as well, which has got to be a good thing for, for, for all of us. Um, so we're really proud of those programmes, and mm. I think they fit really nicely in with things like, you know, with the home of the National Wildflower Centre, mm -hmm. we've obviously got horticulture, we've got the students that we just talked about. The whole gamut sort of comes together and, and it starts to feel of, you know, if you like, one sort of civilization, if you yeah. like. Yeah, but it's, what's so interesting is how it knits so many things together, which is what I always find really fascinating. So for example, with the, with the sort of health side of things, you know, the NHS is looking a lot at preventative health care now, yep. um, you know, green infrastructure, which is all the living stuff, you know, all the, all the landscape, green things. Um, you know, we can now add values to that and attribute values to that in terms of healthcare, yep. which is really exciting because it's showing really positive results. Um, but also for 
areas which are high stress, we know that we can significantly reduce stress in those environments. So in care homes, for example, which have a very high turnover of staff, typically staff are under a lot of pressure. Yep. Um, there's been some really interesting studies, I'm gonna butcher the figures, but there was something like 300 nurses taken from a range of care homes who had had, I think, significant leave over the previous yep. year. Um, and you know they just weren't turning up for work, they're very stressed, um, a lot of health issues related to that. Um, so there were, a project was started to get them to spend 120 minutes in nature. Um, this is where I, I forget it, I can't remember if it's a week or per day, mm -hmm. um, but either way it's a decent amount of time outside that a lot of people probably yep. don't, most people probably still don't do that. Um, and after six months, 90% had returned to work. Yep. After 12 months, I think it was um, 80%, 86% had stayed in work. So there's a huge opportunity to you know, re-evaluate some of these things and think, you know, if you're a care provider, you're not just caring for your um, residents, you also have a duty of care That's to your staff. Massive. So how do you approach that yeah. challenge? And it's, it's all about that bigger ethos behind it, it all. It's, and I think the more kind of switched on employers are recognizing mm -hmm. this. I mean, um, and often, you know, some of the more switched on ones are the public sector because they, you know, they we get shot for saying this, we have larger sort of uh, training budgets and, mm -hmm. and this sort of thing where you can invest into it. But you, we, we've had people coming here who are looking at things like surf therapy now as well as to, um, oh. which, which sort of brings up a little smile in your yeah. mind to start with. Is this just a say? But actually the results are exactly, because you've got cold, mm -hmm. water, cold water immersion, you've got access to, to the outdoors and, and mm -hmm. a, two hours per week, I think was the, the, the same sort of thing. And the impact on getting people back to work quicker is, mm -hmm. is, is definitely right. Um, and it, it, it's just that whole, um, that whole area is just fascinating that we, the, 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 the oft said thing about the NHS, which is, is wonderful, is it's not so much a national health service as a national illness service, yeah. you know, yeah, at, yeah. at one level. So, and, and what we know is with the pandemic is there is a tsunami of mental health, mm -hmm. uh, you know, hitting us, you know, whether it's anxiety or depression or, or whatever. And actually s schemes like these are going to be really important because we're just not going to have the beds and the spaces available um, or indeed the amount of therapists that we need. So if we can, if we can be part of that, um, done in the right way, because mm -hmm. you, you've got to have the right checks and balances, then I, then I think it's incredibly exciting. So, uh, and it does good for the, for the natural world at the same time. So it, exactly. it feels like a bit of a win-win, doesn't it? It does, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and it's, you know, this is the thing. It's, we need to restore the natural environment. We also need to restore people. Yep. You know, people have you know, been put down for a long time and we've kind of gone too far you know, the wrong way in the way we approach work and things as well. And actually, you know, just reevaluating how we live our lives is, is really important. And if we can take all of these things together, for, um, forward together, then, you know, again, it's, you know, hitting two birds with one stone. We're, we're seeing the same, um, actually, you were, you were mentioning the, the, the other projects. So our, our big project in the North England is in mm. Morecambe. So Morecambe Bay, don't know if you know it, but it's this absolute, you know, you've got the Lake District in the background, you've mm. got... Um, you know, the fastest tidal bore in Europe, so mm -hmm. the, the, the water reputedly comes in and out at the speed of a, of a galloping horse, and you don't <laughs> believe it until you see it, and you go, where did, where did that sea just come from? So, um, and we've, we've, um, we were lucky enough to win uh, a um, People's uh, Lottery grant there for their COVID recovery piece. Mm -hmm. And the project's called The Bay, it's with the NHS, um, they're locally in the two nature um, trust, the wildlife trust, sorry. Um, and it's trying to do exactly that. It's trying to do mm -hmm. social prescription in that area, which is this, I mean, it's, it's, it's proper, can I call it hardcore natural environment? You know, you've got, you've got marine, you've got, you know, the, um, the parkland as well, you've got the lakes in the, in the background. But the, um, putting three locations around the bay, so one in Mork and one in Barrow, uh, and the other one I think is going into, into Arnside. Is, is just a really interesting way of bringing the sort of community together and at this time where it really needs it. And it's great to see people like, you know, the, the People's Postcode Lottery saying that's something we really want to back, you know, yeah. and, and working with the NHS and, and, and so on. And I think the results are going to be, are going to be brilliant on, uh, on that. And in a place that really needs it. I mean, one of the reasons we're in Morecambe is that it's the classic British seaside story. Why, yeah. why did we all go to the seaside, you know, mm -hmm when we worked in the mines and the mills and, and so on, it was to take the air, if you like. Mm -hmm. I think Morecambe's strap line is um, beauty surrounds, health abounds. Yeah. Um, and, and then cheap air travel in the 70s and 80s suddenly meant that you didn't have to go to the end of the pier to see a taste of the exotic, you jumped on a plane mm -hmm. and, and off you went. 
And so the towns, you know, be it Morecambe, but there's plenty of other examples, have sort of withered. Mm -hmm. But what's also happened is that the, the, the people and their health have, if you like, withered. They've got lower educational attainment, they've got lower health and well-being scores. The sort of multiple indices of, of deprivation are, mm -hmm. are kind of off the, off the scale. All, all in these, so these coastal communities, why the, the government had these sort of coastal communities report. That's why we're in, in Morecambe, but what, I mean, what you see is, you know, we hope to open in 24, probably 25, the way things are going um, at the moment. But these sort of meanwhile programs, doing things that, that are happening whilst you're building these projects, yeah. brilliant, because here we couldn't do that because nobody yeah. knew it was going to be a success. There you can do your supply chain from day one, you can do mm -hmm. your social prescribing and 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 and, and you, you actually create this, this catalytic effect quite, quite quickly. That's it. Well, some of our colleagues who do a lot of work with children, they um, get children involved in the building of, of yeah. schemes. They do, it's all about natural play and getting kids involved with the environment. And as part of that process, they get kids involved in model making to come up with ideas and designs and things as well to get them involved in that sort of design process. But then when it comes to the plants, they do sensory plant workshops and they get yep. kids smelling and tasting and eating the plants. Just, just here, you've got a bit of that in the, in the Mediterranean. Well, you can, so you, you, you can, can smell it as you come through. It's here, incredible. So, yeah, yeah, it's yeah. absolutely an oh, amazing I, atmosphere. I remember the arguments we had about this. We're in the, in the Mediterranean <laughs> terrace here in the kitchen, mm -hmm. um, you know, behind the camera and the, the horticulturists are doing their nuts, I think, is the, <laughs> is the phrase about would we wreck the smells of this area? So we've yeah. got a very good extraction system over there <laughs> to make sure we don't, because otherwise you don't get the rosemaries and so on. That's it, but it's, it really hits you when you come in here. It's really amazing. And it just, it just creates that atmosphere of, and that calming effect of sort of chilling out and just enjoying you know, where you are. It's, it's really powerful. It, it is, I mean, it's a great space. We're very lucky and you, know, you have the kind of highs and lows, if you like, of, of, a, of a journey around Eden. Our, the rainforest is mm -hmm. like the high of the symphony and, and, yeah. and this is the moment where you kind of come in and you go, ah. And these, the, uh, you're, you won't be able to pick them, but the, the olive trees that we got here are mm -hmm. you know, roughly a thousand years old that we were, oh, we were wow. very lucky to get. Mm -hmm. And yet they kind of look like they belong. Yeah, in here, and they give people again that sense, the same as the redwoods, mm -hmm. of just stopping and saying, "Wow, what 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 are those trees? If you like, seen within within their lives, mm -hmm. um, you know, where are all those civilizations that thought that they'd mastered nature? Oh, they're yeah. all gone, aren't they? What, what's happened to the Egyptians? So, yeah. uh, you know, and, and and so, and I think that's the thing for us is that that um, there's there's this sort of sense that those societies were all full of people who thought that they understood how the world worked mm -hmm. and yet those civilizations are, are, are gone in the lifetime of those redwoods and those sequoias and those olive trees it's interesting it. isn't it it is so, it's incredible well i was up in scotland recently um i can't remember where it is now but with the with the old yew tree up there which I think oh, yeah. is it's five to seven thousand years yeah. old and you just think that it used to be so big that they used to host meetings beneath it yep. um, and you just think my you know my what was society like then you know it's just incredible that these things have been there for so long and you know but we've you. been custodians of them for for so long and it's only really in our recent history that we've kind of stepped back and lost a lot of that connection of maintaining these ancient places that have such heritage yeah you know they're so important Tre the trees are you know it's like um the, the royal oak pubs yeah a lot of people don't realize that the reason they're called the royal oak is because um of course yeah. Uh, the king hid in it yeah. when he was being chased by the parliamentarians, yeah. you know, and you think, oh, oh, wow, you know, you don't attribute that really important story to, to trees necessarily. And Definitely not. And actually in all cultures as well, because the, the baobab tree, of course, in mm. Africa is the, is, the, is the sort of village tree as well for yeah. the same sort, of, same sort of reason. That's it, exactly. It's, but a lot of that connection's kind of been lost, you know, just in a couple of generations, which is, you know, so sad really in a way. But again, there's that great opportunity to revitalize that and help people understand their heritage. And, you know, especially now where we do have a much more um, global world where mm. people are traveling around much more. Um, you know, I've seen evidence to suggest challenges facing some people, again, around mental health is they feel like they don't belong. Mm. But actually what makes a, a place is, again, the landscape is about having those materials and those places that you can which are distinctive because the architecture largely can be, you know, be replicated anywhere really, yep. but the plants and things much more likely can only be limited to that sort of yeah, remote can. geography yep. locally. So it's such an important part of creating that. It, it, it is, and I think, you know, oft underestimated and, and you know, you see it when you go around the world. I mean, if, if you're, I mean, I could pick almost any city. I mean, Beijing just came to mind. Is that mm. there's the moment where there's the triangular building, there's the square building, there's mm. the sort of slightly, you know, cylindrical building, and then London's got it, 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 its examples. And they, they, they don't, um, 
they don't give you that sense of uh, belonging is exactly the right the right phrase and and um, you know how how one creates that uh, and how one then creates communities ar around things is, mm -hmm. is is fascinating and um, you know probably used to be called placemaking I think a, a, a bit more. What's clear is that the, that the natural world is a big component of that. Yeah. And I think as we look forward, you know, us humans have been very bad at looking to the future and, and actually seeing things coming uh, ahead. Driverless cars or automated cars which I mean basically my car will now drive itself you know mm. it, it's not allowed to but it but it but it will um, if if that becomes a reality and I think it will really quickly we suddenly won't need as much road infrastructure as we've got because mm. they'll be able to, to drive along much closer together and much more efficiently so suddenly the fact that you live on the I don't know the edge of the A30 or the edge, edge of the A219 in the, in the middle of London or whatever will mean that 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 infrastructure can be used in a completely different way. That tarmac concrete infrastructure will, will, will be gone. It will exactly. completely revolutionise well, our, our towns in, and cities. Indeed, you see it in places like um, Oslo. So they've put yeah. um, a tram lines in Oslo. Um, and what they've, they've done is, well, obviously, cars don't need to go on the tram line. It's what the tram, that's where the trams go. So they've greened it all. So it's all yeah. um, uh, wildflowers or grass yeah. and all lined with trees and all this type of thing. And it creates this, you know, ever such a great green route through the city. It, and you're starting absolutely. to see that in Birmingham. Some of yeah. the um, stops in Birmingham now are really, really green with living walls around them and um, grass where the tram goes. Um, and you just think, yeah, why, why not? They've, they've done it in um, Seoul is the example that always jumps to mind, which, mm. um, you know, it's, it, Korea is one of the few countries in the world that's investing into, into arboretum and, and botanic gardens in a, in a really big way. Um, and um, we're obviously about to get a helicopter landing on us here. So, um, <laughs> uh, and, and what, um, what the, the, the Koreans have got, I've forgotten what it's called because it's got such a long name, but it's right in the center of Seoul where they've mm. given over this road to become this waterway. Yeah. And it's got all sorts of, you know, wonderful uh, stuff kind of that's, that's sprouted up around it. And they've got another one, which is a one and a half kilometer motorway bridge. Ah, that's called Solio. I remember now mm. that one. Um, and I, when I was up there, there were, there were pianos to play along the, the <laughs> side of it with all this sort of planting and so on, which was, which was you know, it, it's great fun and, and just, you know, a different way about thinking about making people feel um, part of their place. And, and Korea's example is, is that they've invested heavily in gardens and forests, but they've also then moved their population into the big cities. Mm -hmm. So they've done both together, which is, yeah. is, is quite interesting. And, and um, you know, they're great, great ones for forest bathing and you yeah. know, all this sort of stuff. So That's it. Well, that's what's interesting, isn't it? It's kind of, again, it's, there's, such, there's such a big conversation that needs to be had. Um, you know, I was talking about it the other day in Birmingham because they're planning on building a lot of, on a lot yep. of the green spaces there now. But they're planning on building just low density housing and you just think well you're destroying all of this green mm. space whereas actually if you think about it surely it would be better to build higher density but very well which has everything people need spaces yep. for people to break yep. out gardens all of this type of thing one that makes much makes uh, public transport much more accessible and more effective um, but it saves a lot of these big open green spaces it, which we it, need to enhance does. for nature i think it's a really interesting debate and we're, we're, we're having it with a couple of um fairly large sort of housing developers at the moment mm -hmm. as to is there a you know if, if you're being capitalist about about it for a minute is there an enhancement that that can come from um creating those sort of communal green spaces that mean that they sell their properties faster that'd be yeah. really good if there was because then that would that would that would really stimulate them to do it but actually the conversation that we're in is irrelevant of that for a moment and by the way we think that that that, that hypothesis probably is true there must be ways about making those places feel better and pe feel at one with nature, whether it's the wildflower centers mm. and, um, you know, doing their stuff, whether it's about, um, I don't know, using, I mean, I saw one recently, which is about using moss, which yeah. is much better at filtering the, uh, the, the, the air and is much low uh, maintenance than, than grass. Sorry, that was me mowing the lawn. <laughs> um, so, um, and there's just different ways about thinking. And, and these guys are looking at all of these things. And, and I think they need organizations like ours and, and others mm. to sort of challenge them to say Definitely. there is a different way. Definitely. Well, there's, there's a lot of research out there again on some of these things. So, for example, um, Davies White, the landscape architects, we work with a lot of the ones I was talking about with yep. the play. They, um, they've designed some, um, well, okay, so, so playgrounds typically lower the value of houses nearby yes. because you don't want screaming kids and all this type of thing. But then what, how do our playgrounds typically look? Well, they're wet poor, um, springy chickens, yep. as um, my friend Avon always describes them. Um, 
and you know steel and yep. stone. That's yeah. it, really. Um, and they design, redesigned a scheme. Um, I can't remember. I think it's in London. Um, and what materials have they used? Well, it's sand as a safety surface, bark. Yep. They've increased tree cover, so there's now masses of trees. Yep. They've used topography to sort of screen bits off and shelter bits and create a more interesting environment for kids because you don't need a lot of change to make something very inviting for a kid. If you think small children, you know, if you have a bit of mound at the height of this table, no, all of a sudden they have no idea what's the other side. Yeah. And there's that interest of, you know, vistas and things pulling them around yeah. into new spaces. and. If you've got everything in just a big square of, of wet pour, one, that's not very nice under your feet. It's much more interesting to be on sand. But two, um, you know, they can experience that thing multiple times. If, if they can't see it and they go somewhere and then they come back to yeah, it, and yeah, it's that whole exploration thing. But that scheme has increased the value of all the properties nearby I'm not since it's been finished. I'm not surprised because there's, um, you know, I, I know, you know I'm, I'm, I'm the proud owner of a, of a, small, a couple of them. Um, small <laughs> people and you know when you <laughs> oh, go me and too. You, yeah, yeah and, and when you go and you see something that's kind of all metal as it was mm -hmm. when, when we were probably growing up there's something just different about going to, to one of those places that, that just feels different and mm -hmm. um you just instantly um you know you instantly know don't you that it that, that it's, a, it's a more relaxing experience for everyone i wonder if there's any research done to say that they're quieter well, as well for the <laughs> yeah, well that's true yeah <laughs> so, was, hopefully the increased planting will dampen it a bit but yeah. It, yeah but um but it's interesting when you go through and look at other the other end of the spectrum because when you start looking at things like dementia um materials like wood become even more important yeah. because when you're touching something cold it causes shock and yeah. can cause stress and all these yeah. types of things so those more natural materials become even more important on things like handrails and and things yeah, like that do. which you otherwise might not have thought of and um you know office design you know there's a lot of evidence to say that you know exposed timber has a calming effect and we've gone we've moved away from um, uh, timber frame buildings with exposed timber and actually yeah. going back to that has that yeah. huge it, it does health benefit and, too. I, and is 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 ultimately better for the um, for the environment, and it's amazing what they can do with timber. I mean, we're looking mm. for uh, for that Morecambe project. It, it is it, they will it, there be a timber substructure, uh, yeah. substructure, superstructure is mm -hmm. what I'm trying to say. Um, you know, whereas here it was it was steel. You know, yeah. what's what's actually frightening in a way though is, you know, people look at these buildings and they still say to us, "God, they're so innovative." And by the way, they are um, they're much more efficient than they ever thought that they would be. Um, once we get geothermal up and running, it will it will really work. Mm -hmm. um, but the scary thing is, is these are 25-year-old technology. Mm -hmm. And so um, as good as they are, is this, is this as far as we can go? Exactly, and, yeah. And I, and I think that, that, that's why we're challenging our, ourselves, really, to, to say there must be a way of doing this at the same sort of um, mm -hmm. uh, rate. You know, why does it have to cost more to, to do these things? What are the materials that we should be using? And, mm -hmm. and all that sort of good stuff. And... and um, but it's it's actually quite hard. You know, it's quite hard to get the architects in the end. You have to find the right people yeah. um, to, to, to have that dialogue um, with. Well, this is the thing. They're all kind of emerging technologies in a mm. way, aren't they? So people are afraid to take that leap, which is where organisations like you are so important well, for, for doing it. Nobody got fired for buying IBM. Remember that phrase? You know, yeah. I, I buy what, whatever. You know, it's, it's the same as water systems. Don't get a start on water systems. Mm. So there's, there's a, a, something that we want to do here, which is that, Water systems are designed by engineers. They've been the same for hundreds of years. Mm -hmm. But five percent of of, um, uh, of uh, sorry, ninety five percent of the illnesses come through our water system because they they are basically filtered with sand, and mm -hmm. sand is known to have these sort of little wormholes that, mm -hmm. that appear every so often. They let the that let the bad stuff through. I'm oversimplifying, but <laughs> but there are materials available, you know, which can be made by the way from recycled glass, you mm -hmm. know, which is a lovely circular system that don't have those wormholes and, and eradicate it. But the industry won't adopt it because they've got these big systems that are in play that, that have been working like that for years and years mm -hmm. and years. Um, so there's another thing that we're going to demonstrate here. So I don't know how we got onto that, but anyway. That's, uh, <laughs> well, they're, they're it, just, it just shows though, isn't it? That there's an opportunity for innovation in so many areas. It's just about taking that leap, making people aware of it. Um, you know, an example I've been looking at lately is um, heating systems. Yep. A friend of mine has invested in a new heating system and it's basically like wallpaper. So you lay it on your walls, you can wallpaper over the top of it. It's got very, very low electrical current. Wow. So you can put nails through it with no risk of fire or electrocution. But it only reaches about 27 degrees temperature. Yep. So it's a very, very low energy intensity. There's yep. no risk of being burnt on it. You don't need radiators. So suddenly you've cleared up, reduced a load of piping and risk of water leaks and gain space and walls. Um, and actually, 
it's so simple anyone can install it because yep. it's essentially wallpaper. And that can go under the floor, on the wall, in the ceiling, wow. anywhere. In a shower, Consistent. so when you know, touch the wall in the shower, it's freezing cold, yeah, you think, yeah. oh God. You can put it in your shower to reduce condensation and things as well. And it reduces drafts right. around the house and movement of dust and things too. So again, it's got some health benefits, it's lower energy, and actually it's more accessible to people. But it's a technology that lots of people have never heard of. No. Um, but it's been there for a while. He's had it in his house for 13 years. Crikey. And you think, why has that not yep. appeared anywhere else? So, you know, there's a lot of things out there that just are sort of hidden away that you never... Well, no, I think with this, this, this renewables piece now, you know, solar, wind, um, and hopefully geothermal, you, you, and things like wave um, power mm -hmm. and so on, as well, tidal power, there's more than enough to go around if you invest. And actually, solar and wind are really good examples where... You know, it used to be kind of slightly speculative, and it was a bit, you know, off mm -hmm. the edge. And now suddenly, these are these are understood investment models. Everyone knows what they're going to get for, you know, 25 years. The, the returns are really exactly. easy, so people invest in them. Mm -hmm. They don't need government incentives. And I think that's that's you know going back to what we were talking about. That's why there are going to be certain things where we just have to force behaviours at, at a particular moments. But we need we need government to stick with them. So. Um, electrical cars, electrical electric cars, for example. I think they 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 reduce the incentive just too early at the, at, mm. the, at the wrong wrong moment now. Whereas I think just continuing to push that is, has got to be part of the change that we need to make. Um, and, you know, but we then got, what it also does is you've got to look at the grid, you know. And yeah. I mean, I happen, to, I happen to drive one, but my car is, will, will, will power my house for five days hmm. on its battery. And when you realise that, it actually shows you that you can manage power across the grid because most of the journeys that we take are pretty are pretty short, so you don't need 250 miles. But as long as you've got the certainty that you can get that power, you know, when when you need it, and so all of th those batteries effectively sitting outside our house are connected to our to our mains to manage those fluctuations. Suddenly becomes quite interesting. Yeah, definitely. So um, anyway, we we digress. No, but it's all about resilience, isn't it? Because you know, I run a small business. We work from home. If there's a power cut that's the business down. Yeah. And you've got to start thinking, well, are we going to get power cuts? Well, this winter, who knows? Um, and it's becoming increasingly likely. So actually, we've got to start thinking, how yeah. do we build in that resilience for ourselves, let alone sort of, if you ignore society for a moment and thinking yeah. about it very selfishly, you know, it is kind of like, well, how do I save money? How do we, you know, reduce the risk we face? Yeah. And a lot of it, just, again, comes back to the environment. You yeah. know, it the technology is there now to take that risk away and hopefully make people, make people a bit more secure. Well, now that, now that gas is so damn expensive, yeah. you know, that everyone is, is trying to... I, I think it's what you were saying earlier about, about your, your friends and people investing into, into solar and so on, because yeah. it just, it just becomes, the, it becomes the right thing to do and it's economically not that much more. Whereas actually one of the problems has been that, you know, if you want to install air source or ground source until recently, the gap, even with the government incentives and the and the RHAs, was still you know you're still so looking seven at years, yeah, it? yeah seven seven years you know maybe nine and da, da, da. Mm. Um, and I and I think whereas uh, you know every cloud you know mm. in, in in the gas crisis so yeah. it might, might well be that that forces a few people over the over the line that otherwise wouldn't have done exactly exactly. Well, I think we're going to have to leave it there um, because I know you've got to get off to some other meetings. But that was a really interesting conversation. I'm, and I'm glad it went quite broad, actually, talking about the range of things that are actually going on and getting you know, another perspective on it. Because you've got such a range of experience and because you're involved in so many places, it really is interesting to hear you know, how other places are approaching issues. And that actually, what, what really pleases me is a lot of places we go to, people are now on the same wavelength. A few years ago, you talk to people and they sort of have very, very different ideas. But mm. I think now they've sort of coalesced into this kind of, you know, we know kind of what the solutions are. It's just a case of, of delivering doing them. them and doing Get them. Action, exactly. not words. So exactly uh, I think it's a key thing. Well, look, pleasure to talk to you. So I uh, hope it goes mm. well. And, um, you know, if you ever want to come back here into the, into the med at night oh, and have to, some yeah. squash on the table, <laughs> you're most welcome. Thank you very much. Pleasure. See you then. I really hope you've enjoyed this episode. If you're interested in finding out more about how the environment and society are interlinked, then maybe check out our episode with Judy Lingwong, where we talk about the relationships between people and the natural world. Don't forget to like and subscribe and share to friends and colleagues who may be interested. A huge thank you to our sponsor, Beans Accountants, for supporting this episode. Our kind supporters, Gillian Goodson Design and the Birmingham Botanical Gardens. And of course, the incredible Eden Project for hosting us. And finally, Monster Don and NDLA for helping power this episode. Thank you very much.